Hello there. In this week's Data Vault Radio Show, we're going to be taking a look at the latest news. I'm going to have a chat to DV trainer Mark Winkelman about, well, how this sound kind of changed the way Hollywood works, as well as a whole bunch of actual data management stuff. And we're going to take a look back at some old footage about the importance of needing experts when it comes to data transformation. All that and more in this week's episode of the Data Vault Radio Show. Hey, thanks for joining me for episode three of the Data Vault radio show. I'm Paul, your host, and you can find me and a whole bunch of other people in the industry floating around at dvic.accelerate.world. It's where the Data Vault Innovators Community Forums are. Jump on, have a chat. It's completely free, and it's great to meet other people in the data industry. In today's episode, I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an update on the news, and a little bit later, I'll be sitting down and chatting to DV trainer Mark Winkelman, who originally wanted to be a teacher and then sort of missed the exam to be able to do that and now in a way kind of is teaching anyway. On top of that I'm going to be taking a look at a piece of older content from one of our master classes last year that looks into the need for experts when it comes to helping organizations with their transition to more modern data platforms and much more modern data governance. But all of that will be a little bit later. First up here's the news. Oracle have announced the general availability of a new generative AI service, along with a beta offering for related AI agents service. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, OCI, Generative AI, is described as a fully managed service that provides an API to seamlessly integrate large language models into projects for writing assistance, summarization, analysis, and chat. Some use cases addressed include customer operations, such as automating customer service based on the customer's product suite, experience, and language, risk and legal, accelerating contract writing and drafting based on existing best practices with multilingual support, and strategy and finance, at scale monitoring of competitors and updates from customers across public and private sources. Oracle's take on agents is called OCI Generative AI Agents Service. It's a beta release. These agents are customized and tailored to work with company data, acting like a specialized mini chat GPT specific to an organization's setup. Agents translate user queries into tasks that generative AI components perform to answer the queries, according to Oracle on January 23. The first in a series of OCI generative AI agents is a retrieval augmented generation agent that complements the general knowledge of LLMs with internal data using OCI OpenSearch to provide contextually relevant answers. Users can now transparently access diverse enterprise data sets through natural language without the need for specialist skills or to know the data's format or storage location. Oracle also touted another new AI offering in the works, OCI Data Science AI Quick Actions, described as a no-code service that eases access to a wide range of open-source LLMs, including offerings from Meta, Mistral, AI, and more. OCI Data Science Quick Actions provides access to curated models that users can fine-tune, evaluate, and deploy with their data but it also encompasses a comprehensive ecosystem where user-friendly workflows, integrated telemetry and visualizations, and simplified execution processes, says Oracle, which listed the following features expected to be ready for use when the service reaches general availability. There's an A-list of curated pre-tested models, including LLMs, along with curated deployment options. The ability to search and filter models and the flexibility to search the model that best suits your needs and an interface for executing fine-tuning tasks with guided steps in monitoring, verification, and environmental pre-check, as well as a playground feature for quickly testing deployed models. Interesting developments for those working in and with the Oracle data environments. One announcement that caught our eye last week was OneTrust, announcing the launch of its data privacy maturity model. According to their announcement, the model provides privacy, security, marketing, and data teams with the resources to transform their privacy programs from tactical compliance initiatives that mitigate risk to strategic customer trust imperatives that unlock the value of data for AI innovation, customer engagement, and business analytics. Oyas Reji from OneTrust explains, 
The expanding footprint of regulation, the urgency of building first-party data sets, and the responsibility of ethically managing data-hungry AI models reinforce the business criticality of getting data privacy right. He went on to say, by maturing their data privacy programs, organizations can better tie data privacy to business value, establish a common internal language for cross-functional collaboration, and design their program roadmap. As data privacy programs are still relatively new for many organizations, they often face cultural challenges, business silos, and conflicting internal priorities. I'm sure many of our listeners to this show would be familiar with these sort of internal challenges, particularly the issue of trust and how it impacts perceived value. OneTrust went on to say that when an individual trusts that a company is using their data responsibly, they're willing to share more data, enabling the company to increase its customer engagement, loyalty, and lifetime value. This represents a virtuous cycle of earning, retaining, and expanding customer trust to unlock the value of data, and this needs to be a strategic goal for any mature data privacy program. We'd be really interested actually to get your thoughts on this topic, so please make sure you jump over to the Data Vault Innovators Community Forums and let us know what you think about this one. Now, in a developing story from February 8th, Sam Altman posting on X slash Twitter that OpenAI believes, quote, The world needs more AI infrastructure fabrication capacity, energy data centers, etc., than people are currently planning to build. He added that building massive scale AI infrastructure in a resilient supply chain is crucial to economic competitiveness, and that OpenAI would try to help. On the same day, the Wall Street Journal broke the story that Altman himself is seeking trillions of dollars to reshape business of chips and AI. Reporting that the OpenAI chief was pursuing investors including the United Arab Emirates for a project possibly requiring up to $7 trillion. This is the largest single capital raise ever to date, more than the GDP of Japan and around about the same amount as the US federal budget for 2022. The fundraising plans are aimed at solving constraints to OpenAI's growth, including the scarcity of the pricey AI chips required to train the LLMs behind AI systems like ChatGPT. This announcement has further fueled speculation that the likelihood of artificial general intelligence, or AGI, has been achieved, leaving the impediment of processing power as one of the most significant barriers to widespread adoption. This, coupled with the announcement of GPT-5 earlier by Altman, suggests that 2024 will be an even bigger year than last year in the adoption of AI across industries. For more information on this kind of thing, or to have your say about some of these news stories, please check out the post that we've got on our community forum at dvic.accelerate.world, or go and join one of the conversations that are going on there right now. And that's all the time we've got for news this week. Now, I'm going to jump over very quickly to Germany, where I had a chance recently to catch up with Mark Finkelman. He's a Data Vault trainer who was mentored originally by one of the people behind Data Vault in its current shape, Michael Oshimke. It was fascinating to sit down and have a chat to him about what drove him from wanting to be a teacher to where he is now, where he's still kind of teaching people, but in a slightly different way. So let's sit down and have a chat with Mark Winkelmann. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, It must be bright and early where you are at the moment. I'm guessing sun's out. No, it's middle of winter for you, isn't it? Yeah, the sun is already out. It's uh, 10 o'clock. So I just started working two hours ago. Mm, I'm sorry about that. Starting work. (laughs) Nobody wants to do that. What's your your time? You already finished Um, or will finish after this interview? (laughs) This is the last thing I'm doing for the day, but it's about 10 o'clock at night here. So bright and early. It's all right. Yeah. I've got I have a five fifteen in the morning meeting um, on Friday, and that day won't finish until probably about eleven o'clock at night. So this is <laughs> this is fine. This is fine. Um, so I guess first question for you then is, um, what do you think is the big thing people need to know about Scale Free? We are a consulting company and focus on uh, BI and data vault, and we are, I would say, really good at it. So we um, um, take a, a big eye on quality. So um, e- even in the last past years, as we grow, so we uh, had an eye on not growing too fast and uh, not focusing too much on the quantity, but still keeping a big uh, amount of quality. So yes, I would say uh, it's a young company. So I'm working mm-hmm. at Scaffy for or almost since the beginning. So I 
uh, got all the history of Scafree, like uh, started with three, four, five people. And um, I also remember, or maybe to start a bit more earlier, how I joined Scafree, because yeah. and how I, I I get in touch with all this thing with uh, big data with uh, BI and uh, data world. Uh, it was in uh, in the university. That's where I might met Michael Schinke the first time. Right. So was Michael he one of your lecturers? Yes, exactly. So he was my lecturer. And uh, it was a bit lucky for me because it was my last semester in in the, in the university and his first semester as lecturer. So and oh. uh, I I just learned uh, all the database things. Uh, I, I joined the IT world really late uh, in the middle of my 20s. And um, that was the first time I heard about databases and so on. And then he came in with the data vault thing and I thought, wow, it's too complex. It's I, I was really not convinced about data vault at the beginning. And yeah, uh, over the time, he, he convinced me then with all the stories behind why we're doing that, that complex, or it's not complex, but why we're doing it that way. And uh, yeah, then I really became a fan of it and uh, wrote my, my bachelor thesis about it. And after, the, uh, after my study, um, he, um, he founded Scafree and he asked me to join and yeah, I'm still here. So he was my mentor. <laughs> and then, yeah, with starting at Scafree, I think we started with the, um, um, with with the, yeah, with Michael, someone who takes care of HR, someone who takes care of the finance part, and uh, he, he added me to to support him with the data world part, and uh, mm -hmm. yeah, then the company grow. Uh, we set up a stable back office processes and so on, and uh, yeah, over the time, then also getting new consultants, of course, and then growing the business. Also funny, maybe at the beginning, we did a lot of trainings, these uh, data world uh, mm -hmm. boot camps. And uh, that was our main focus at the beginning. But then we turned it into a con really consulting company. And uh, I really like to see um, nowadays we, we hire a lot of people. We are able to hire them and uh, bring them on a good path to also ensure the quality I mentioned. And that's a really nice thing to guide also the new people and help them to yeah, to, to learn the data world thing, to learn all the BI world. And uh, it's really impressive when I see, because as I mentioned, um, I started with that in the middle of my 20s. And uh, when I see really young people at the beginning of their 20s, and they're much better than I was at that age. <laughs> <laughs> I know really they're dealing really well. It, it's yeah. a little jarring sometimes. So you've sort of gone from having a mentor to being a mentor within the, the, the industry then. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? You've sort of gone from be from having a mentor and somebody like Michael to being a mentor okay. to other people coming uh, yes. through the industry. Yeah, yeah, that makes, that's really yeah. How, how does that make you feel? <laughs> no pressure. Really nice. Like, <laughs> I I I really like to uh, share knowledge. That's also why mm -hmm. I'm doing uh, the the data world uh, trainings right now. Um, I, I'm doing it right now, to, uh, so I have to join in, uh, jump in in a few hours. And, okay, um, I won't keep you that long. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And uh, my before I studied the information IT world, I want to become a teacher in in Germany here, but um, mm -hmm. I I missed uh, the. I think there was a sport test because I want to become a teacher in sports and mathematics because I really like the the logical parts when something is uh, logical and clear and explainable. So and I like sports so. Um, so that was my first plan, very first plan, studying mathematics and sports. But I missed the, the schedule of the. There was a sports test you have to make before you can uh, sign up for for the sports study. What's in a sports test? Yeah, you, you have what to make sure that. They, I don't know what they're doing. I think you have to run, you have to jump, you have to do some things to prove oh. that you are able to be a sports teacher. Right. <laughs> that so, sounds and, horrifying. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I missed it. <laughs> uh, as as yeah. I wanted to sign up for the study, I saw, oh, the test was two weeks ago. So yeah, I had to wait oh. a half a year and then I, I didn't do it. And I thought, what else I can do? And I thought, okay, I, I, I did an apprenticeship before in uh, wholesale trading. So I was familiar mm -hmm. with the, um, with the um, economics and I like mathematics and also IT. Uh, so I selected to a uh, study called the Business Information System, so the thing in, in between, where the focus was on business intelligence. 
And yeah, that's how I learned it. And yeah, then sorry, back to your main question regarding the mentoring. Um, I I was really just as I started uh, studying and so on. I was really the the, the small boy, let's say. I uh, learned a lot from a lot of people, right? Uh, especially Michael. And then over the time, it turns, and then you are the mentor of a lot of people, and that feels really good. And uh, because now back to, to my first part of the story, I want to become a teacher. I really like to to uh, share my knowledge, and uh, yeah, that's really satisfying. So it sounds in the roundabout way you got to where you wanted to be anyway, just took you a slightly different route to get there. Yeah, definitely. And and I'm a little bit proud, don't, don't tell it to my wife, <laughs> because my wife is a teacher. And uh, when I hear her stories, I'm, I'm a bit proud or I'm a bit happy that uh, I didn't go that way because um, <laughs> I realize I really like to, to um, share my knowledge with people who really want to have my knowledge, right? And that's just maybe yeah. not the case if you go to school. <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes yeah. you have to force students into these things. It's painful. It's why I don't teach anymore. I just couldn't do yeah. it. Drove from your head. <laughs> um, yeah. You mentioned yeah, you I wanted mean, to be a sports teacher. What, what's your favorite sport? I mean, uh, I think I know the answer to this one because it's, as I say, it's the same answer for everybody in Europe, from what I understand. Everybody loves football. Yeah. Um, which team do you support? Um, we have a local team here. I'm from Hanover. So there's a local team uh, called Hanover 96. I, I would say I'm not a, a big, I, I was a bigger fan in the earlier days as, as I had more time like uh, during my <laughs> apprenticeship. <laughs> so I, but I would say I'm in a stadium one, two times per year, maybe three times. So, um, yeah. and of course, as soon as the big events start, like the world championship, European championship, then of course mm -hmm. I'm supporting the German national, national team. Yeah. Of course, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, you play on the team for Scale Free? Because I know Scale Free has their own team. Are you uh, have you been conscripted for that? Yeah, yeah. We um I, I would say we I think we don't have an uh, completely official team yet, so with a name and, okay. and, and so on. But but yes, we play regularly on uh yeah, smaller football uh, or a soccer uh, cor uh, courts. And uh, yeah, that's that's really really fun. Because there's no one who's really really professional, so we're all beginners. So the only thing you what, what you have to take care of is uh, accidents. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I saw Christoph's accident that he had, and oh yeah, that that seemed brutal. Even like it was only just a little finger, but it still seemed way too painful. Not not something anybody would yeah, want. Yeah, I I I I was there. I was close to the accident. Yeah, <laughs> I saw Ooh. it. Oh was... no, no. So so, what do you do then to unwind? How do, how do you sort of de-stress? Uh, sorry, again, the question. How do you unwind? Uh, what 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 sort of thing do you do to de-stress after a long day or to relax on a day yeah. off? Um, what I do, I I like to. I, I'm not a big fan of uh, running or jogging, but it helps to get unstressed. Um, mm -hmm. Other than that, uh, I like to go swimming. Swimming from time to time. There, there are usually phases where I do it uh, regularly, like uh, three times per week. And then there's a, a break for a couple of weeks, uh, two, three weeks, and then I start again. <laughs> and when the weather is good. Uh, yeah. I was going to say the weather there at the moment can't be very conducive for running or swimming. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, I, I really like to bicycle, but uh, only when mm -hmm. the weather is good. Fair. I, I, I'm a rider myself, but I don't tend to get off the lounge. I've got an exercise bike that I sit there and watch Star Trek on. It's great fun. Yeah. It's a great way to de-stress. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you read? Do you, is, do you, are you a big reader at all or not a big reader? Uh, I'm actually not a big reader. Um, okay. But uh, okay. What the, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book right now from uh, it's called... But I'm I'm reading that for weeks already, and just just a couple of pages per day at the end of the day. Um, it's called the Metro Metro Twenty Thirty Three or something. It's a science fiction okay. book. It's really it's okay. It's it's okay. But the uh, wait the the last book I read was last winter, I guess, as we were in Denmark, uh, because mm -hmm. then calm down and you have time, and uh, uh, that was a thriller from. 
I, I called the author was called uh, Sebastian Fitzek, the package. It was mm-hmm. that was nice. I've heard of that one. Do you read digitally, like like on a Kindle, or do you prefer paper? Uh paper. If I really read book, uh, it's paper. I I don't have a Kindle or something like that. Uh, I mean, PDFs I read on maybe on the on the lap on the screen, but real books yeah. only on paper. No, fair enough. I'm the same. I I can't stand reading digital copies. It just yeah. gives me a headache for some reason, which is very odd. Um, what about television? Do you have like a favorite science fiction show or movie? Oh, um, um, show. I wait. Let me think about this movie. I would say Inception, because Ooh, I'm I'm good. because I'm I'm thinking right now about okay. There are so many science fiction movies, and also I like. Um, to, to be honest, maybe the most obvious answer is maybe Star Wars or like that. So I I, mm-hmm. I watched the series, but never became a fan of it. I don't know. Didn't catch me. <laughs> But uh, I like, uh, yeah, Inception. I remember as I watched it. I think I watched it three times in summary, uh, mm-hmm. or more. And this is all also one of the less hard copies I have here. Dome. <laughs> I think that's a good sign when you when when you say what's your favorite movie. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I can't answer the question. Like I, I, I can't narrow it down. It, it's really difficult for me but inception is brilliant inception was actually for me really good in terms of the marketing as well it it actually that the trailer for inception shaped the way that movie trailers were made and i think that's something that people don't realize is actually quite common you every sort of couple of years you get a big way for a movie to be advertised that shakes up the whole sort of industry and you start to see mimics of it and for inception it was actually the the big the bois sound that they used in their trailer um, that ended up in something like 150 trailers over the next year. Like it was, it was absolutely massive in the way it shook things up. Same way that the Matrix did it with um, Bullet Time. You just sort of get this one thing that people latch on to. And yeah, Inception is one of those films that are absolutely brilliant, but I love the way that it changed the game for a lot of people. And yeah, yeah and, and so the cool music, I, I, like, I like Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's an amazing composer. And I, I saw an interview actually with Christopher Nolan the other day. And he was saying that that the work he does with Hans Zimmer is just it's because Zimmer gets the feeling that that Nolan wants everyone to have in the audience, and it makes them nervous. Like it, it just puts everybody on edge slightly, and he loves how that the music can do that to an audience. That's yeah, uh, it's okay. Nice. So much craftsmanship that goes into it. it it's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me about pet peeves, which I understand is probably not a very German concept. From what I've been told, like little annoyances that bug you, do you have any mm-hmm. during work or in my private life? <laughs> Whatever you're comfortable sharing. Oh, okay. Um, I like when uh, when it's so from private perspective. I like when uh, when my apartment is clean, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm I, maybe I'm yeah. I I don't like when things are not there where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> mm-hmm. Say it this way, uh, this makes me a bit let's uh, maybe not annoying, but I, I have the feeling that I have to clean it up before I go back to yeah my bigger projects. Right? Um, yeah, but I would say that's that's it here. Yeah, from from when I turn it because I'm uh, yeah working uh, when I work all the day, um, uh, turn it to the to the work life. Um, what what else? I think because I'm dealing with. They are handling with data. I would say, me data quality. So this is really annoying mm-hmm. when data quality is not good, especially on on key level, because what we do in the data world, uh, world. So one big objective is to integrate the data from a lot of systems by business mm-hmm. terminology, by business keys, and when they are not good set up, so that you have to take a lot of effort in finding the correct keys or mapping the the keys and so on. This can also be really annoying. So remediation is not something you enjoy doing. Yeah, I mean it has to be done at the end, mm-hmm. but uh, life could be much easier if it would be better <laughs> in uh, in the step before. <laughs> I know that feeling really well, but I I also work on the belief that everything would be better if everyone just listened to me and did what I told them all the time. And <laughs> I'm told that's not the best attitude to take people. <laughs> they don't like that for some reason. Of course, of course. 
Mark, we're done and dusted. Thank you very much for joining me. It's very appreciated. Um, I will let you go back to work now and finish off everything else you got to do and get more coffee to get through the rest of the day. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me and uh, have a great evening. I want to thank Mark again for joining me. It's a really fascinating thing for me to sit down and see how somebody might end up in the position that they're in at the moment, their journey to get to that point. And one of the things that it reminded me of, particularly when you talk to Mark around training and how much he enjoys training people who are really keen to learn, is why it's so important to have people who are experts when it comes to data management within your organization. And there are a whole bunch of risks between getting somebody who's really keen and enthusiastic but doesn't have that skill base. It reminded me of something that we actually made in October last year uh, for the Data Vault Masterclass. It's a conversation here with Michael Oshimke, Knowles Eberson, and Julian Redman. And it's about the importance of having experts on your team who not only understand the importance of data, but also the importance of making sure your data is done right. You have a listen to this. Uh, what do you do when you don't have access to subject matter experts? Michael, why don't you start with that one? Okay, um, I have two answers on this one. So let's say my preference is if at the client there are, so here's the thing. So I tell clients in a situation that you can give me budget and we are happy to burn it, but that wouldn't help you, right? So that's, that's not really of value. Um, so in the best case, what I'm doing is I'm trying to convince the client to really send in subject matter experts who know the data processes, uh, the, the business processes to help us to, to be successful, essentially. If that's not possible, my preferred choice, my second preferred choice is then to find another project at the client where they have the budget and the subject matter experts available to help us essentially, because I, I really value the the um, presence of or the, the, the participation of subject matter experts in a project yep. that high, right? Um, so I, I rather would go for another internal project where they have the time to help us to to develop yep. all these features, these reports, and, and and so on. That's my that's my second preferred choice. And um, what I don't do is to, what I see some of the clients is they just create a role in the role because they don't know what the, how the business will work with the solution they're building. And that's that's really burning money yeah. a lot. That's what I see. Nose, what do you have? There? So yeah, I, I always get the yeah, great. You need a subject matter expert. So I agree wholeheartedly with Michael. If you don't have one, you need to agree with the business on what the impact would be. And the impact's this. I can become the subject matter expert. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take money. And then once we know what we're doing, it'll be quick to build a vault. But you can't not pay the piper. You have to become a subject matter expert. You, if you don't have one, you become one. And you have to pay school money. And school money is in money is in budget burn. So if the business cannot afford to spare the person, they have to spare the budget. So, so yep. Yep. let me ask a, a slightly, you know, drilling into that, I guess. Um, Let's say that the organization has some very old applications and they don't have anyone who really knows those mm -hmm. anymore. Is there tools you can use, like the discovery tools and stuff, do enough? Or or can yes. you know, do you just have to spend the analysis time? How does that fit? Thou shalt not start data vault without profiling your data. Okay. <laughs> That's a key oh. command. So irrespective yep. of whether I have the subject matter expert or not. You always profile the yep. data. You start to understand how the data exists within the systems because what we understand and what the systems do is not necessarily always in sync. This is where the subject matter expert yep. reaches that gap. You very rapidly get there. Now, th there are some really good tools in the marketplace that does some of this discovery, but there is nothing in the marketplace that will discover that the investment choice for a person in a in a pension fund is stored on the broker extension field called broker flag 07. There's nothing but a subject matter expert that eventually will tease out that kind of detail to it. Is it valuable? Absolutely. Is it foolproof? No. And so you then become the subject matter expert. Now it's incumbent on you as the person engaged to bring the business to become the subject matter expert that you do not perpetuate the sins of the past you must capture what you gather in a wiki, some sort of knowledge base or, or knowledge management platform that becomes part of the project collateral. 
Now, if you keep that all yeah. to yourself, you may have some job security, but eventually they'll fire you anyway. That's not what you want to do, right? You want to move on to more exciting stuff. So uh, maintaining and managing a wiki is an absolute must as part of this process. Whether you have access to a subject matter expert or whether you have access to profiling or other discovery tools, that's fantastic, except you have to capture the decisions and the outcomes uh, and you need you need to become a subject matter expert if you don't have one. And you need to make sure the business understands this. It's not a data vault problem. Yeah. It's a business resource problem. Two distinct things to keep in mind. Sure. Michael, anything else to add to that one? Uh, only a few topics or a few points. Um, the thing is that when you, we have these migration projects sometimes. And if you have a legacy system and there's, Everybody's gone who built the system, who knows the system. Well, then you have to you have to pay the price. I mean, you have to really analyze the systems because we need to know how they work, what how, how the data looks like, and so on. Right? There needs to be some source system analyzer, essential system analyzer. That's why it is. I mean, the other option would be to have a wizard in a team, but there are no wizards, so that's that's not an option. So it's really analyze the source system, analyze the system you want to replace, and that's why it is. It's it's pure standard IT. And there's nothing even special about yeah, data yeah. here. It's, it's and and prototyping seen... is your friend. Yep. Prototyping is the friend because you have to then expose it to yep. the business. Go, does this smell right? And they go, uh, no, it's supposed to look like this. And go, how's that possible? Yeah. And so off to the races you go, reverse engineering and figuring things out. Eventually, you'll get to the to the to the, mm -hmm. uh, the secret sauce there. But it takes time. It takes budget. And, and I'm sure we've all seen these projects that are very IT driven and, you know, and either the business doesn't want to engage or IT doesn't want to let them engage. And it, they always go slow and they're always hard, right, because it is that subject matter expert. But let me add one final bit to this is in a, the data mesh paradigm where we're trying to have data products, do those SMEs become the data product owners? Is that kind of the idea? Is that how that works? So the ideal we'll product go with yeah. yeah, perfect. Because right. they That's know what it is, question. they know the context, they know where it's supposed to happen or where it can't be used and where it should be used, all of those type of things. And they should capture that in their uh, interface agreement, their product uh, engagement model. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's it for the end of the show. I want to thank Mark for joining me for this week's interview. It's always fascinating to me to meet new people and hear about how they got to where they are in the industry. So really appreciate Mark giving me the chance to sit down and have a chat to him. And now that sound either means it's the end of the episode or reality is folding in on itself as we go through various layers of dream state. And to be honest, I don't really want to work out which one it is. So I'm just going to wrap up here. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe the episode and come join the conversation on the Data Vault Innovators Community Forums, which you can find at the link that's on screen and in the bio at the moment. Until next time, have yourself a great week and may the force be with you.